Hello, everyone. This is number three in my series that I've called Fateful Passages of the New Testament. And I want to say again, as I've said with the previous episodes, I'm not necessarily talking about the entire historical context of these passages, which could have different meanings according to the times, but the idea that certain phrases and sections of New Testament passages are pulled up out of the text and then quoted and used and have been used over many centuries to cause all kinds of harm to human beings. And so I use the word fateful uh, by the dictionary definition. So today, the phrase or the text that I want to talk about is from the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians particularly, where he talks about women should keep silent in all the churches. We'll see that there's an earlier section of that letter that also is relevant when Paul talks about women covering their heads, and I'll go through that as well in terms of what that means, because I don't think it's talking about a veil. The veil, the idea of putting cloth over your head, is not even mentioned, even though that's how it's been interpreted through the ages. But I want to talk about this idea that women should be silent and should be subservient. So let me share my screen. And this is a PDF, and I will make it available to you as a download in the description. Most of you probably have Bibles. You could look it up, but it's nice to have this as a handout uh, as I'm going to go over it. So women keep silent is what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians 14. Now, I'm going to add as I start here that many Bible scholars and interpreters of the New Testament, I'm talking about academics, consider that this section of Paul is not really written by Paul, but it's an interpolation. That would be very similar to what I covered earlier in the first segment that I did on Jewish blood guilt, the passage in 1 Thessalonians where Paul talks about the Jews killing the Lord and so forth, and God's wrath has come upon them at last. It seems to be the kind of a nasty Paul, and there's some that think that passage, along with this one, was not really written by Paul. But textually, if you look at various Greek manuscripts, there's no evidence that this is not by Paul. And the vocabulary and style does indeed fit Paul. And also just the kind of argumentation that Paul makes, particularly in these two passages. Now, this one is usually considered to be authentically from Paul, but this first one, from which I've drawn the title, is often thought to be an interpolation. And I think Paul wrote this. So 1 Corinthians 14, as in all the churches of the saints... Churches just means assembly. Saints just means those who are part of the group. They're sanctified. It's not the later use of the word saint. So in all the churches, so what he's basically saying here is this is my rule everywhere in the different congregations that I've set up. The women should keep silence in the churches, meaning in the assembly. So when the church gathers together, and that's the context, they're not permitted to speak Wow, that's pretty heavy, but should be subordinate, even as the law says. Now, this means the Torah, not the Roman law. Now, where does the Torah say that women should be subordinate? But he's probably referring to the early passages in the book of Genesis that record the creation of Adam and Eve, and when they sin or disobey God and are put out of the garden that's in Eden, the woman is told, your desire will be toward your man and he will rule over you. So that's apparently what Paul has in mind. There's a kind of a hierarchy here. If there's anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. And again, we say church today in a different way, but it means in the assembly. And then he says, what? Did the word of God originate with you? Are you the only ones that is reached? So apparently he's getting a report 
from people at Corinth that the women are getting out of hand. But he cracks down on things with this ruling. He wants order. And that's the whole point of this chapter, if you read it all. He says at the end, I want all things to be done decently and in order. But look at this next verse. This is right after verse 36. If anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is a command of the Lord. That means Jesus, when Paul just uses the term the Lord. It doesn't mean the creator God, Yahweh or Jehovah. But notice this, if anyone does not recognize this, meaning my authority, he's not recognized. Now, throughout 1 Corinthians, and I'm not going to go into the whole letter, of course, Paul has insubordinate people. He has enemies. He has people that are basically saying, who's Paul? Do we have to listen to him? Because when Paul writes 1 Corinthians, he's not there. He's founded the church, but others have come including Apollos, he mentions in the early part of the letter, chapter 1, and also even Peter has come through, apparently, or at least some of them know of Peter. So the church is kind of out of hand here, and he really lays down the law. So that's the main passage. Women should keep silence. If they have a question or something they want to know, save it till you get home. You might say, well, what if they're not married? Presumably, they would then ask their fathers. So really, this is not very comprehensive because women can be in all sorts of states and situations in which there's not a male for them to ask or deal with as a kind of a spokesperson. Because women can be in all kinds of life circumstances and situations in which there would not be a husband that they could ask, or even a father in some cases. Remember, there are slaves in this church as well. And uh, who would they ask? I guess they could ask their masters, but let's go on. Now, earlier in the same letter, as I mentioned, you've got something that's somewhat parallel. And most scholars do accept this longer passage as coming genuinely from Paul. And it's authentic Paul, not an interpolation. But it has some of the same ideas inherent behind the ruling, and these are basically rulings, as we're going to see. I commend you because you remember me and everything and maintain the traditions even as I've delivered them to you. Now, Paul always uses that kind of psychological approach. I'm glad you're doing well and respecting me, but, and then he'll mention a problem. So what does he say? But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So imagine a chart, God the creator, Christ, male, the men, and women under their husbands. So that's very similar to this. It's, it's the same idea, basically. There's no reason to think Paul didn't say this if he said this. And then he goes into a very puzzling passage that people usually think is about putting a veil over your head, a cloth, and I think it's actually about hair length and hair style, not to have short hair or particularly to put your hair up rather than using the hair as a covering. It's referred to in other parts of the New Testament. I'll put a picture up here of a Roman lady of the times from Pompeii having her hair up and braided and her neck and part of her shoulders exposed. And that's what Paul does not want to see. So we got this hierarchy, and then he says, any man who prays or prophesies, and again, man means male in these passages, with his head covered dishonors his head. Now there it does sound like a veil, but men don't wear veils. As you're going to see on down, it means a man having long hair. So the hair is the covering. If you keep that in mind, the word veil never occurs. There's no noun here. When it says in some translations, then let her wear a veil, it actually says, let her cover her head, meaning with her hair. Then it becomes clear. It's the same as if her head were shaven. So you see it's talking about the hair. For if a woman will not cover herself, then she should cut off her hair. In other words, if you won't wear it properly, just cut it all off and be a shameful woman. And you say, well, that would be disgraceful to be shorn or shaven like a man. Well, then cover yourself. 
meaning have long hair. That's the meaning. For a man ought not to cover his head, remember the hierarchy, since he's the image and glory of God. Now notice this, but woman is the glory of man? Imagine that thought in the same way that human males reflect God, human females come from males and therefore they reflect the man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Remember in the creation story again, and I gave you my translation of Genesis last time, those first three chapters, and I'll put it up again in this video. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That's very similar to this, this idea of as the law says. So why are women created? They're created for men. This is why women don't typically like Paul. That is why a woman ought to cover her head because of the angels. We're not completely clear on what he means by because of the angels, but there are two possibilities I think that make sense to me. One is the hierarchy of the angels. There's mythology in Hebrew tradition, and it's reflected in the New Testament, that a certain number of angels were rebellious against God and got out of their place. And so this would be a woman getting out of her place. But there's also a passage in Genesis 6 where the sons of God, which are the angelic beings, see the daughters of men that they are fair, and they come down and sleep with them and impregnate them. Angels lusted after these human women. That's one interpretation of Genesis 6, and it seems to be what that passage is saying. It's one of the strange passages of the Hebrew Bible. So the idea would be that in an assembly, there should be no sexuality. Men are separate from women. Women are not to get up and speak and lead. Why? This is true in many religious cultures, Orthodox Judaism, Islam, because men would be bothered or disturbed by attractive women. And if the women are showing parts of their body like the neck, remember in every culture, there are different standards of modesty. When my grandmother and great-grandmother grew up in the early 20th century, and my great-grandmother even in the late 19th century, to even show part of your ankle or leg was incredibly provocative and improper, like nakedness. It's exposing a kind of nakedness. And then he says, kind of parenthetically, and this is the Revised Standard Version, and they put parentheses here. Now, I've changed a few things in this passage from the RSV because they use the word veil, like wear a veil, and it never mentions anything about a thing called a veil. The hair is the covering, as Paul makes clear. Nevertheless, in the Lord, so he's trying to say, you know, it's not that bad because woman is not independent of man or man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. All things are from God. Now, some people say man, meaning the man Christ, is born of a woman. So kind of a new creation, and I guess that's a possibility. But I think what he's really saying is in Christ, in the Lord, there's neither male nor female. But we're not quite in the kingdom of God yet. In other words, we're not transform angelic beings in which there would be no sexuality, neither male nor female. Now, Paul is willing to say in books like Galatians that in Christ there's not male or female, slave or free, rich or poor, Jew or Gentile, but obviously in the world as he's living in it before the end of the age, which he thinks has grown very near, these differences do exist. They're from the old creation of Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, and they should be respected and honored. And I would add here from my own perspective, just from reading Paul for many, many years, that he probably doesn't care so much about this, but he's worried about how it will look to some of the more conservative Jewish thinking members of the Jesus movement, particularly James and the Jerusalem church, who would have a more orthodox Jewish approach to things most likely. Then let's go on. Judge for yourselves. So he's saying, you know, 
you could just figure this out yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with their head uncovered, with their hair up, showing her neck, being erotic in that culture? Is, is that proper? Would you want that? Does not nature itself teach you for a man to wear long hair is degrading to him? Then he becomes effeminate, as Paul would have it here. But if a woman has long hair, it's her pride. For her hair is given to her as a covering. For her hair is given to her as a covering. Now notice this. If anyone is disposed to be contentious, we recognize no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Just like the passage in chapter 14, if you don't recognize what Paul is saying, then you are not recognized. So he's really laying down the law here, as we say. Now, this approach of Paul in these two texts of 1 Corinthians gets expanded and reinforced in other letters attributed to Paul, although most scholars would say these letters like First and Second Timothy and Titus are secondarily Paul. They're Pauline in a certain sense, but they're expanded Paul written after his death. So 1 Timothy 2, 11, let a woman learn in silence with all submissiveness, just a paraphrase of what we saw in chapter 14. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over men. She is to keep silent. Well, have authority could even mean, what, any kind of leadership position? Just like in 1 Corinthians, he goes back to the Torah, back to Genesis. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. Now, Paul doesn't go into that. He's talking about more the hierarchy of creation, that first the man, then the woman, and then it gets equal because men finally are born of women. So everything evens out. But here it's much more of a direct, almost slap in the face to women. You women are the ones responsible for everything going wrong. You were deceived and became transgressors. Yet women will be saved through bearing children. Remember in Genesis where God says to Eve, with labor or pain, you will bring forth children. Just as Adam will in pain and in labor till the earth. It's actually the same word for men and women. That's your role, is to bear children, and it's not an easy task. And the man's job is to be the breadwinner and till the earth. Now, I don't think I need to tell anybody the tremendous influence that these passages have had, and therefore the whole approach to women through the ages, especially in Christian cultures. Now, I'm not just blaming Christianity, because Paul's reflecting to some degree his own culture coming from Judaism as well. And we still see this in conservative Jewish circles as well as Muslim circles that are reflecting the same subordinate view of women. And it's true around the world in many cultures, but the church particularly has enforced this. So whole conservative churches get split by whether a woman can even take any kind of minor leadership position. I grew up in the Churches of Christ, and one of the crazy big discussions was could women pass out the communion on Sunday? You know, the bread, the plate of the unleavened bread and the grape juice, because in the Church of Christ, they didn't believe in even drinking wine. So bread and wine, could the women just pass it out? That seems to be fairly subservient. But I guess the idea would be that the men would be looking at the women, maybe, or something like that. And I know that issue seems to be fairly trivial, but God forbid that a woman would be a teacher or a minister or a preacher or a priest. So you can see the tremendous influence. My mother was born in 1916, and women in America, at least, were not given the right to vote until 1919. So I guess we've come a long way, but churches are still split conservative churches over the role of women in the church. And the great church, the Catholic church, has all kinds of factions and discussions over whether women could be ordained or be priests or have leadership positions in various ways. Now, I do want to say one thing in Paul's behalf, 
because I've devoted a great part of my career to studying Paul. I've got two books written on Paul. I'll put them up on the screen. One is Paul and Jesus, where I go through his basic ideas. The other is a more academic book, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, which deals with Paul's mysticism and his message and so forth in the context of the broader Hellenistic Roman world. So I just want to add on the basis of my understanding of Paul, he thinks that very shortly, probably in a year or so, or just a few years, Jesus Christ is going to return in the clouds of heaven. The dead in Christ are going to be raised. The living are going to be transformed into these glorious spirit beings. And echoing the thought of Jesus in Mark, in Luke, in Matthew, in the Gospels, those who attain to the resurrection of the dead won't marry or give in marriage, will be like angels of heaven in these glorified bodies, and according to Paul, will even be above angels. So this hierarchy of God and Christ and the angels and male and females, and I guess you could go on down and put children under the woman and finally maybe even your pets, for all I know, that's all going to pass away. So when you think about the tremendous influence that Paul has had just by writing those few words and reflecting those ideas, and Paul does say in 1 Corinthians, as we saw in the second episode of this series about sexuality and being celibate, that the form of this world is passing away. Literally in Greek, that's the word schema, the order the setup, we would say today, is all passing, present tense right now. It's fading away. But until that happens, Paul wants stability, and he doesn't want disruption, and he wants to reflect the old order, almost like, hold on, it won't be long till all this will be redeemed and changed. So slaves, obey your masters. Women, keep silent and be submissive to your husband who is your head, and Jews respect Gentiles, and Gentiles respect Jews. Every person remain where he or she is, and in Christ it will all be soon changed. But here's the problem with Paul. It's pretty obvious. The end did not come. So if we could bring Paul back to the 21st century and say, Paul, is this really what you had in mind? Another couple thousand years? where women would still be in such a position of subservience because the new creation has not arrived? Is it possible that a modern Paul would say, wait, 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 for the time that fit, but for today, we have to have a new view of things because my view of the imminent apocalypse that I'm going to even live to see obviously did not come about. So take care, everyone. And we'll consider another one of these fateful passages in the next segment.